Welcome back to the Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm Rich Folley. This is PBS Book View Now. And I'm sitting here with Katherine Patterson, two-time Newbery Medal winner, and just an amazing person all around. So cool to have you here. Lovely to be here, too. Yeah, I, I was chasing you down. I wanted you on our set so badly. Um, I'm Bridge to Terabithia, Jacob I Have Love. Some of your books mean so much to the kids in my family. Um, but there's a couple reasons why you're here right now. We should start with the fact that the great Jilly Hopkins, which is in my hands, is going to be a movie, and it's coming That's out right. in October. What's that like to see one of your books? We've seen it before with Bridge to Terabithia, yeah. obviously. But tell us about what it's like to have your, your books made into movies. Well, I would be terrified except for the fact that my children are in charge. <laughs> oh, wow, that's that's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, and you're in good hands. Yeah, well, David wrote the first script for Bridge, and he's written the only script for Gilly. Yeah. And our son John is helping with the marketing, and they're both producers yeah. on the film. Uh, the only problem is when you have a little family film, money <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> gets to be a problem. But, yeah, I understand um, that. Lionsgate is taking it on, and we're, we're thrilled. So what's it like to see your characters come alive off the screen in a well, way? You have the vision of them, obviously, in your head. We all do as we read your books. What's I, it like to see them? I wrote to Kathy Bates, and I said, of all the characters in every book I've written, Mamie Trotter's my favorite. Oh. But I've got to tell you what I've been telling everybody. I will never think of her again without seeing her as Kathy Bates has revealed her. Oh, I love that she story. So you, you approve. One of absolutely yeah. approve, yes. Isn't that interesting how these, these characters like Harry Potter and all these others, you have a vision of them and even you have pictures of them maybe drawn, uh -huh. but they do become, if the movies are successful enough, yes. those characters, and to some degree that's kind of taking them from you or maybe it's evolving. I, but no, no, I, I, I don't often ever feel that readers or actors take from me. I think they expand. Yeah. And I've done plays before. Yeah. And I love to see what actors and directors do with my story because right. it always makes the story bigger. Yeah, it sure does. Uh, and and I, I love that. Yeah. And we have such an amazing cast for this movie. Um, Kathy Bates, Sophie Nelise, who was the book thief, yep. is is Gilly Hopkins. She has experience in these adaptations. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Um, Glenn Close is the grandmother. Octavia Spencer is the most astounding teacher you have ever hoped to see. She's an author see. herself and loves yeah. books. Oh my goodness, she is wonderful. Yeah. So we were just so fortunate to have these wonderful people agree to play these roles for a fraction of what they should command. You know, it's it's cool to see you delight in in your story and to like think of it from the outside almost as you're looking at it. It's like, this I can. is wonderful. I yeah. mean, I've seen this movie about eight times. <laughs> okay. And every time I just marvel at the wonderful acting yeah. and directing in it. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, we're all excited about it. Well, please I have go to see tell it. you, I was also really excited about reading stories of my life, which yeah. is your memoir, and well, how that came about, and telling your life story, not just yours, your family's, and, and some other things, but I would love for you to tell me about that moment when you realized there was this treasure trove of information out there that, that you could dive into to really help fill out some of the, the, the life story that you, you came yeah, from. Well, I, I began to realize that there were stories, especially family stories, that I hadn't really told my children and grandchildren. And I thought, you know, I, n I really need to write those down because they get lost otherwise. Yeah. And uh, so I, uh, my husband was sick for a long time and it was, a, it was something very healing to be able to write these short, you know. Vignettes. Vignettes and yeah. stories because uh, the kind of brain power and time it took to really do a novel, I just didn't have at that period. Right. So, um, it was kind of a gift to myself and to my family. And, and then my good friend Nancy Graff said, if you're going to publish it, you have to tie it into the books you've written. So yeah. I went back and rewrote it so that you could see a little more clearly where, how, everything came where the from. books had come from. Yeah, and I, I love that part about it. I love the photographs. I love the stories. I love the fact that you can tie the, directly some of these stories into some of your own novels. I think mm. that sort of behind the scenes peek into your life. Yeah. Did, when you were writing it, did it feel fun to write or was it something where you felt like you were giving, you are exposing your life? What were the thoughts? Well, it was so funny because somebody said to me, 
you know, you, you put so, so much of yourself into your novels, it must have been terrible to write about your own life. And I thought, no, 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 it's just <laughs> lots of fun. It's quite she fun. She said, what? And I said, you notice I didn't tell you every story. <laughs> I just told you the stories I wanted to tell. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, well, you're ex you're described as a rock contour by by your uh, friend and fellow writer Kate the Camillo. And there's another woman uh, I can't remember. Sorry, Nancy Graff. N Nancy Wright, who, who a close has friend. who has uh, uh, lunch with you every week, and you <laughs> tell stories. This is your MO. You are a storyteller, not just in print, but apparently in your everyday life as well. Well, I, I'm always a little embarrassed because I don't have any short stories. Yeah. And I launch into them and I think, oh my land, this is going to. Yeah, but they're great. <laughs> People tell get us, so bored. <laughs> you have to tell us about Maud because Kate said she's got to tell me. She like makes you tell it every yeah. time and you probably get tired and of it, telling that it. That was so wonderful. Uh, this is a woman that was a hero to me when I was a child. And I, I just told about the final kiss once to Kate. And she said, if you don't tell Maud's story, I'm going to tell it. I said, no, 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 that's my Maud. Yeah. And I went back and I was amazingly able to find out all these things of letters she had written from China during the war and everything that were just astounding. Yeah. And, and so I got to know her a lot better than I had as, as a child and a young person. I bet. And what's it like too finding like this 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 uh, trove of letters that your father had written that you didn't know I didn't. that were even there, and and you found out that they exist, and to be able to dive into his mind and what it he was, was it was amazing because my mother was a great letter writer, she wrote lots of people all the time. My father, in my whole lifetime, wrote me about five letters maybe. Yeah. And uh, so I just thought he didn't write letters. And I was with my, his younger sisters who lived well up into their 90s. And I just was trying to make conversation. I said, you know, it was a shame Daddy never wrote letters because he would have been, had such different stories to tell from the ones my mother did. Because my mother was just trying to keep her mother from being worried <laughs> in a time That's when right. there was war and, That's right. and terrible time. things going on. And, and uh, they said, What do you mean? He wrote Mama every week. And I thought, What? And I said, You wouldn't happen to have those letters, would you? Well, we wouldn't have thrown them away. And, and they knew exactly where they and were. They, they sent me this big box of letters. That, I'm sure not every letter, but. Many, many letters that my father. So, what had was written. that like when you were able to start reading them? Because you said your father didn't write you like that. Obviously, you knew him it from the outside. It was astounding. It was astounding. What did you learn? Because he, he really wrote in great detail, and he t he didn't spare uh, his family at all about the, the, really, very difficult, scary times that yeah. were happening and about the people who starved and putting the babies out to be, ex girls always, to be exposed and that sort of thing, which my mother would never have told her mother. Wow. I mean, it would just been too hard. Did it help you figure out how you became a writer? I mean, how did you yeah, find your way? Yeah, I, um, you know, I never thought of him as a writer and I don't think he would have ever thought of himself as a writer. And yet he wrote some very beautiful letters. Yeah, so what did you read when you were younger and how did you become the writer that you are today. I mean, you, you, you're oh. prolific and you've written some amazing books. Well, I, you know, I wasn't a writer as a child. Most people were writers as children, <clears throat> but I was a reader. And we lived in China when I was tiny and the only books we had were the ones in our, our library. We did have sort of a fairy godmother uh, who sent us books to China and I had I had mostly British books, actually. They were, uh, you know, all of A.A. A. Milne, all of Kenneth Graham, um, all of Beatrix Potter, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, just really wonderful classic books for children, which I adored. And yeah. I, I had an older brother and sister and, and two younger sisters, but uh, they were a good bit younger. And so mother was reading to us and my older brother and sister, of course, began to read, and I couldn't stand not being able to read. So right. I actually cannot remember a time when I couldn't read. 
Now, I'm sure there not. must have been such a time. I doubt it. I but, bet you were finding your way to book somehow. Yeah, or because yeah. I just had to read. Tell me about, your, your, you know, as you think back on your, your career, and there's more to come, but when you think about the role that you played in engaging students and kids' minds and young readers' minds, um, have you stopped to think about like that, what you did and putting it in context with and the importance of that or not, perhaps, in your it, mind? I mean, what do you think about that world that you created? You no, know, I'm so astounded. I would never have believed that I would have had the life I've had. I mean, it's just, it's too incredible. But, you know, I've been going around the National Book Festival today and person after person who is totally grown with children of their own is telling me how much my books meant to them when they yeah. were children. It's amazing. Yeah. It's, it, it is, these books are books that are on bookshelves all across the world, basically, but they, they've had such an effect and they have a lasting power to them. How do you, how do you explain that? I mean, the fact that I these books continue know, to, to I don't know. Generations. I really don't know, except that, and I think it was on Bridge to Terabithia that I finally realized that, because I didn't, I wasn't even sure that book would be published because it was so anguished and so a personal a story that when I sent it to my editor, I wasn't sure if it would, you know, what would happen. And, and then when it was accepted and published, I thought nobody would understand it. I, have, I cannot tell you how astounded and overwhelmed I was with the reaction. Yeah. And I began to think about it. I thought, you know, I wrote that book out of real personal anguish and pain and not knowing how to explain things, tragedy that was unexplainable. And, and so I was really exposing the darkest, deepest part of myself when I wrote that book. And then I thought afterwards, but if you're willing to expose the darkest, deepest part of yourself to your readers, they respond mm -hmm. from the darkest, deepest part of themselves. I don't even think, maybe, maybe you didn't know that you were doing that at the time, but it was like, you, you touched on mm. the truth, you yeah, know? Well, and that truth resonates. Yeah, well, I'm very grateful, yeah. you know? I'm very grateful, and it just, it's, it's very humbling, really, because I think it's a gift, you know? Yeah. Uh, you work like the Dickens, but in the end, it's a gift. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a gift for all of us, too. Yeah. All the books that you've written, all of them have found audiences at different ages and different worlds. They continue to, to be so popular and successful. Well, and it's you. really fun to see a, a book like The Great Julie Hopkins make its way onto the big screen. Oh, yeah. I don't know what's next. I, I'll go see the Katherine Patterson story. No, well, that, I, I think probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it's so awesome oh, to have you Oh, thank you so much, Rufus. I am such just a fan. A, so just a unabashed. joy to be with you. Thank you. All right, Katherine Patterson, her book, Stories from My Life, or of my life, and of course, the great Julie Hopkins.